you, Mario. So my name is John Thorpe. I'm the technical community manager at CF Engine. Um, how many of you have heard of CF Engine? How many of you thought we were dead? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we're still very much alive and kicking. So right now we're about IT automation of web scale. Um, we look at our differentiators as speed, security, scalability, and stability. Um, as Dave mentioned, you know, we, there's an exciting future for CF Engine. Um, we encourage you to follow us on Twitter. Check us out, we've got some good webinars coming up, a thought leadership series of webinars. Um, we also have our Promise 2014 conference coming up, where you'll hear Mark talk about uh, configuration management, Promise Theory, CF Engine, and a lot of other industry speakers. Uh, Gene Kim, John Willis, Damon Edwards, Jess Humble, you know, and so on. And the lineup is only going to get better over time. So I'd also like to thank all of you for actually coming. You know, this is important time out of your lives. And you know, you're gonna hear some good stuff from Mark. He's been a leader in the industry for um, over 20 years. And you know, it really was his forethought. Uh, and the design of CF Engine really puts us in good shape for where we are now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Mark Burgess, the father of CF Engine, the founder and CTO of the company as well. has limited length. I'm glad I only made it to father this time. Normally it becomes grandfather and great-grandfather and <laughs> I seem to have been getting older over the years. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to this uh, little meetup. They said, come on over, we'll have a few people, we'll have some laughs. And then no one told me that like a hundred people were coming to the talk, so I figured out today that I had to give rather a better talk than I'd planned on giving. Um, so I made some slides, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, we'll have a few laughs. How many of you have used CF Engine actually? CF Engine two, CF Engine three, Puppet, Chef. Ansible, half, oh, one and a half, okay. <laughs> Salt, cool, okay. So you guys know uh, quite a bit about configuration management already. Um, when I was asked to talk about the future of configuration management, I thought, you know, what could I say that you don't know already? Um, I've talked about these things many times in the past, but I think there are a few, when you have my job, which is to go around talking to people and, and listening to uh, all the different stories, you can get kind of an overview of what's going on in the industry, which is apart from any particular set of problems that people have. Because everyone has somewhat different problems. There's a core of similar things going on, but um, the picture that we all are part of is, is somewhat bigger than any one of us is able to see. So I'm hoping to be able to just sketch out a few of those things and please, 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 you know, shout out questions and let's have a discussion around this because it's more fun when it's a, a, an interactive thing. So always good to start with a definition. Am I standing in the way for you guys? And can you hear me okay on this? I'm supposed to do this or this? Okay, that, that was a bit much, yeah? No, no, it's good. The karaoke thing is... It's good. But I didn't shave, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Um, <clears throat> so what is a configuration? A configuration is an arrangement of things into a functional or aesthetic uh, arrangement of things. It's not new. We do this all the time in different situations. Um, I started life actually as a landscape gardener just after school, so I, I learned all about configuring gardens. And, and when I was in Japan <clears throat> in 2010, I realized that the British, the Brits and the Japanese share you know, the love of, of arranging gardens in, uh, in fascinating ways, as well as tea rituals and strange politeness uh, rituals. <laughs> but um, arranging gardens is one way of configuring management. Town planning is another form of configuration management, which perhaps we don't think too much about, 
But I think that's actually an interesting way of looking at config management from a larger perspective because many of us are focused on very small details like planting one rock or planting a bed of flowers in, in the garden. We're not thinking so much about where do the people come in or where, how will we get the best use of sunlight. And those, Louder. you want me to be taller? Louder? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you are a bit short, but no, louder than you. Okay, then, I, then I'll stand on this side because the cable is a little bit short. All right. Uh, <clears throat> many of us have focused on these very tiny details, detailed implementations of a single part of the story, like planting the roses or arranging for the stones to be in the right place. But the town planner has a bigger job. He has to think, you know, where's the traffic going to come in? How are people going to leave? Where are the fire exits? Uh, all of these regulatory compliance uh, issues that we have to arrange for. Um, what if uh, we don't get enough sun here or enough rain there? So the planning at the town level, configuration management takes on a whole different character than uh, the individual playing a small part in the whole. And those things, I think, are, are important. So I'm going to drag this back. Everything's getting taller. <clears throat> See, I didn't want to stand in front of the screen, which is why I stood there. OK, this isn't too bad. And there are other cases of configuration management, which perhaps we don't think of as config management, but have been going on for years and years, like arranging components into circuitry that has a bigger purpose than any one of those particular components. We may deploy an application to the cloud, or we may solder a chip onto a circuit board, and it becomes part of something which is bigger than uh, the individual thing. It becomes part of a whole, which has a function, which has a business purpose, and it makes money. And this is how we all have jobs. And one of the ideas that I had years ago and have never successfully brought to completion is this idea that we could we should really be designing configuration management in the man manner of the old CAD CAM programs. You know, this, how you design your kitchen, your landscape garden, your town, or your electronic circuit. It should be that easy, and we should be able to do it in that way. But we haven't gotten even close to that yet. Because we're still at the, at the, uh, at the level of making these chips and making these <coughs> components to solder onto the, to the boards. And our notion of networking, how we connect these things all together, is still incredibly primitive. We actually have boxes stacked on boxes, and we've got wires coming out of them, and it looks like a jungle. This isn't terribly, um, it doesn't seem very advanced. It's not like Star Trek, you know? I, I kind of want everything to be like Star Trek. One of the things that motivates me is how can we make technology much more integrated into our, our daily lives? and and make it cool. And they have these great blue drinks. Like when I was a kid, I always wanted to have the blue drinks like they had in Star Trek. So I put milk, uh, blue coloring in the milk. <laughs> so the thing that characterizes all of these examples is that they're not scalable. The garden, the electronic circuit, the town, these are not scalable entities. They may be big, they may be grow to big size, but they don't scale. And that's kind of important because we are in a wild scaling fiesta at the moment uh, trying to everyone's trying to grow bigger and get more get their applications to run on more machines handle more throughput and yet we design things by nature in non-scalable ways why do we do that well let's have a look at what I mean by scalability <clears throat> on the left hand side you have something which is not scalable this is a protein uh, we have very many proteins in our body, but they're not scalable in the sense that I can't scale this molecule to a big size. On the right-hand side, you see what I mean by scaling. We have a, uh, a square or a sheet, and I can increase the length and the width by the same proportions, and it becomes a bigger thing. And if I sort of stand at this point of optical uh, <clears throat> focus on the left, and I look, the one will actually overlap the other, and I can't tell the difference. This is a truly scalable system. I just increase everything in proportion, and it just it has the same function, 
which the function doesn't change, it does, just gets bigger. But on this thing on the left, this doesn't uh, scale to large size. I can't make the atoms bigger, because the atoms have a certain size which is pinned to that fixed scale. I can't add more of those atoms without changing its nature. So I can't stick many of these things together without making a new thing. So if I'm going to scale something like <coughs> the thing on the left, I actually have to have I, ha I have to appeal to parallelism. I have to have multiple things. So we go from uh, a single skin cell to tissue. And then I can scale tissue, but I can't scale a single cell. Tissue is a different thing. It has a different functional properties than the single-celled organism. And in a similar way, a single application, like my friend on the left, has very different behavior than a series of applications working side by side. On the other hand, the successful scaling systems, they start from the idea that we're not going to have a unique uh, non-scalable item. We start with cells and tissue and fabrics and parallel systems, and then we scale those. So we have to build scalability from the beginning into the design, otherwise we'll end up with what I would call nanotechnology, which is making very complicated things which don't scale. Come back to that in a, in a second. But So the problems of increasing scale are that we tend to add more things, and then once we add more things, they become more complex because there are more things to deal with. And this all comes about because we have a desire to make life easier for ourselves. We build these applications in order to make life you know, more acceptable, the Star Trek game, or if you don't like <coughs> Star Trek, then think La Dolce Vita. Uh, the story that I usually tell about this is that if you look at the movies that we were watching before the Second World War, it was Metropolis, uh, Rome, Cleopatra, you know, big civilizations, big society, uh, with the day the earth stood still, all about galactic uh, civilizations. And then there was the war, and afterwards it's La Dolce Vita flying around Rome on a scooter. Because Rome didn't want to build another civilization, they wanted the freedom to fly around and have their own thing. They were tired of that big civilization game. And if you look at all the successful technologies since the Second World War, they're all about personal enablement. The microwave oven, the mobile phone, the scooter, the, the motor car, the refrigerator. Things that make us independent and autonomous, in control of our own lives, not dependent on society or others, <coughs> but how we can be as autonomous as we possibly can and have that freedom to move around. I call it the freedom equation. Freedom is me, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that this cloud that we're talking about, that's not the, you know, the cloud isn't this thing in Amazon's basement. It's the cloud is us floating around in space with all of our desires and wishes that drive us to build technologies to give us that freedom. And what is it allows us to handle this complexity? Well, it is that atomicity, that autonomy, that allows us to have the freedom and to scale naturally. So there's a strategy which we know quite well, and those of you who've used technologies like CF Engine will recognize this. Uh, the trick, if you like, to scale systems is to make the parts as individually independent as we possibly can. So we call them autonomous agents or autonomous pieces, but they are not, they have very few dependencies or they're weakly coupled. They're not strongly coupled, they're weakly coupled. So they can float around and they may bump into each other and talk to each other from time to time, but they won't die if they don't. So autonomy, and to, to obtain autonomy we need to atomize the system, turn it into small pieces, atomic pieces, which means basically keep it simple, keep it light, mo mobile, and untethered, so un unconnected by dependencies. And if we do that, it's kind of a, a starting point from which we can build systems that will scale like tissue or um, uh, fabric. <coughs> now, some of you may know that I worked on this problem as when I was a researcher at the university, I started back um, in the days of CF Engine 2, 
And after all those years of experience with CF Engine 2, I wanted kind of a, a way of figuring out how to make CF Engine 2 better. But there wasn't really a model in computer science that described the way CF Engine 2 worked. It was made of these autonomous pieces. And computer science didn't look at autonomous agents as that wasn't how you do it. You do command and control, and you do <coughs> top down systems. You break systems up into pieces, but they're all towers of dependencies, yeah. not independent things loosely coupled. That means they're fragile, they're brittle, and kind of uh, non scalable. They're like the molecule on the left hand side. So I thought, you know, what can I do about this? And I started this um, model, which I called uh, Promise Theory, which is about autonomous independent things and how they can work together, not by being forced into submission, but by offering one another promises to behave in certain ways. And through those promises, they could uh, form expectations of one another's behavior, which was hopefully stable, and then start to work together in patterns. And it turns out that this explains all kinds of different things. And it's actually a model of chemistry. If you think about it, this is how chemistry works. We have atoms which have certain properties. They promise to have certain chemical properties, attract electrons from this <coughs> thing. We have an oxidizing agent or a reducing agent. And these things come together in different ways. They form molecules that have certain functions. We have a protein with nice shapes. It turns things into other things, little machines, da da da. It's a very complicated system of, which you know, results in us, <laughs> ultimately. Pretty complicated machines come from very simple autonomous interactions, chemistry. So why couldn't we do the same thing with computers? Well, we can. We can. And CF Engine kind of does that, right? It makes each individual part of a computer into an autonomous agent that can make certain promises. I'm the password file. I will contain these users. I will not have these bad permissions. I will. Uh, I am the HTTPD daemon. I will be running at all times. These are promises that allow us to form expectations about systems and put them together. Quick example, which you may not have thought about before, but this is somehow, somewhat how the web works as well. If you think about a web page and CSS, um, actually CSS was written by a friend of mine in, in Oslo, so I have to say nice things about it. But I was about to say this rather ugly text at the top of the screen, but this, this well-known text at the top of the screen is as part of a style sheet which takes the autonomous pieces in an HTML file which, and they're labeled right, to make them independent. So like an H1, a, a, a title, uh, or a P, which is a paragraph, labels a region which is basically a, an autonomous piece. And we can arrange for it to have certain color, a certain justification. We can even move these things around the page and completely separate the rendering of these things from the actual objects themselves. These are promises. This thing promises to have red text. It promises to be justified. If we write it more in like CF Engine language, we see that this R really promises. Those of you, I'll show you some CF Engine in a second, but this is, this is what CF Engine looks like. So this is how you can write CFS as CF Engine code, as promise code. And so, what promise theory allows you to do is to see the similarities between these things and think of CF Engine's approach to configuration management is basically style sheets for servers. Yeah. You're laying out your garden with different flower beds here or different files and processes here and here, and you're just laying this thing out as a design to be implemented by a rendering engine or a CF engine. Well. So that's a bit about promises. What do we know about these things? Isn't it implausible that we could create these complicated machines in this way? So here's the very first deployment event, <laughs> which was a relatively successful story. Um, and it was built out of extremely small independent things. There weren't even atoms in those days. You know, In the first moments of the Big Bang, it was tiny little particles. Um, but this was a relatively successful event, and if I if I sort of fast forward through history, you know, uh, <clears throat> formation of uh, hydrogen, uh, 
dinosaurs, whatever. Well, we can, we can test ourselves and see if we can figure out how to make a glass of water in this way. And we need promises, of course. So promise theory is going to make us a glass of water. So I need promises to make molecules, and I need promises about the bonds between these, these molecules as well. So in the context of being inside of a glass, because we want a glass of water, uh, I'm going to make something called water, which is going to promise to have atoms of hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. And then there are other promises between these hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, which is, are listed in the bonds. So their style sheet, is, if you like, is that they will bond, uh, hydrogen will bond with a plus one valency, uh, its oxidation number, if you like, and oxygen will bond with a minus two valency. These are promises that these things will have. And by keeping those promises, when they get together, they bind, and they form things, and they form things that have more properties than the original things. And this is how we build complexity. Exactly analogous situation, just further up the chain, you know, fast forward a few billion years, and we can have applications, and in the context of a web host rather than a glass, we can make a, a glass or a web host of uh, applications, say ticket sales application. I think of ticket sales when I think of applications because uh, when I was at the university, my students were working on the ticket sales in Oslo, which it turns out was a... <laughs> This is a couple of years ago now, but still. It was a 386 PC running a web server with four serial wires at the back, RS-232 wires into a PDP-11. I think today that would qualify as a thing. That is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? PDP-11? Nobody even blinks. That's amazing. They're still used tremendously all over the place. So what? They don't stop working. They just keep going. Apparently. Like CF engine. <laughs> <laughs> you can come again. <laughs> so the application is formed from things. Ticket sales application. A bunch of services. Say we call them services. It might be components, whatever. So maybe we have web, you know, PHP, your SQL database, my SQL database, whatever. And then each one of these services, like the bonds between things, has its own, uh, its own promises threads, certain number, it's going to run over a certain port, um, you know, it's going to have uh, access control lists to allow or deny uh, bonding with others. And in this way we set up applications and these things are promises. These things are configuration items and we see the mapping therefore between configuration and promises. This is nice because what it means is that we can turn a bunch of uh, work, like digging with spades, into a plan for a garden. Instead of thinking about all the actions we're going to take, which may be you know, different at different times, depending on technology, the people, the style, there might be different ways of doing it. We're going to turn it into just a map of the desired end state, the drawing, the architect's drawing. So we're going to start with intent, and the ability to distribute it to do distributed build and repair, big bang, and with a bit of stability, this is going to create something with the freedom to deploy over a wide scale. And this list of promises becomes essentially executable documentation. You just write down the promises and you shake the system, and you've got water, or you've got a garden, or whatever. Because these things will interact, and through their promises, they will bind together and come up with the eventual design. It sounds kind of crazy because what we're taught to do in school is you start at the beginning with a blank machine and you add the first thing and if such and such is true then go this way, else do this, then do this. And you're led through these bizarre narratives to create rather than a design for what you will end up with. Yes sir. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm exactly understanding when you say autonomous entities. So, for example, there's a role of entities each asking for a certain amount of resources, and somebody has to ultimately have a finite number of resources to kind of solve how they coordinate or contention between them. So where is that functionality put? 
Uh, great question. So what are the limits of the resources in which these promises actually uh, take place? I haven't really said anything about that. You're absolutely right. But there will be some sort of a container of stuff that we have to play with, <laughs> an internet of things or a bunch of things, which we have to work with. They might be you know, bits and bytes, software applications, components in a in packages in a package manager. They might be any kind of thing. So I'm talking in a very, in a very abstract kind of way. Uh, but ultimately, we can define what those things are and the promises between them within a certain scope. And then this story starts to make some sense. Does that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? What happens if somebody breaks a promise? What happens if somebody breaks a promise? Have you ever known anyone to break a promise? No. <laughs> you have a realistic, uh, so, uh, by documenting these promises, you actually see all of the failure modes by which your system might break. If you assume that things will, you know, if you do the, if you do the flowchart thing, first do this, then do this, then do this, all you know is what you ended up with. You don't know if you can ever do it again. You don't know the system itself doesn't have a recipe for healing itself or fixing itself. So then you really know nothing about your system except what you ended up with. But if you have documented these promises, you know every single thing that can fail to make the system work. And that means not only do you have executable documentation, but you have uh, a disaster, a fault tree analysis, essentially, of your system, saying these are the potential failure modes in the promises that maybe not kept. So it's a very valuable uh, thing to document. But that's not enough, right? These stories, I mean, this is a nice idea, this um, idea of promise, autonomous agents interacting together. But this isn't the way we think. Human beings, for whatever reason, seem to have evolved to think in stories. There's, there's evidence to suppose that our brains are thinking brains have evolved to form relationships between individuals. And something about that sort of linear narrative seems to be the way that we pass on information. We write language. Language is a linear narrative. We tell stories around the campfire. This is how history was passed on. Our view of time is very linear, even though things are happening all over the place um, in parallel. We don't think in parallel. We think in series. And when we write computer programs, we write them in series, I believe, because we're <coughs> fixed with this idea of the narrative. First you start here, then you do this, then you do this. It's the way we think. Because we want to tell each other stories, and that's how we tell stories. But that's not how the computer needs to, to execute or carry out these things. It's not how chemicals interact. It's not how the Big Bang worked. All of these things around us happen in parallel, in very complex forms of networking interactions, and they do complicated things. So what happens is that when we construct systems by these simple linear stories, and we connect things together through networks, the thing we end up creating is far more complex than any one of those stories that we started out with. And our ability to tell stories about those things is severely inadequate. Because these linear stories simply don't describe networks. Networks are much more complicated than linear storytelling. And yet, we persist with this notion of programming with imperative languages. We persist with the idea of making flowcharts for designs instead of promise-based networks. And it's a cultural habit. I think it's hard to shake, so it's very natural. So somehow, if we're going to win the war of complexity in IT, Configuration needs to have these two aspects. It needs to have independence, weak coupling, promises that define all of the possible chemistry of interactions between things, but we also need the ability to tell stories that we can understand. Let's be clear, we are the limitation, not the processes, but still. Yes, sir, you had a question. I'm just confused on this notion of So if isn't a well-designed flowchart should include all the branch and error conditions. 
Yeah, a well-designed flow chart sh should contain all of the branch and arrow conditions. And if it does, is it different than promise theory? Is it, if it does, do, is it different from promise theory? Yes, it's very different from promise okay, theory. Could you detail that a little bit? Yeah, so, um, a uh, so here's a simple way to put it. A branching story with, uh, with if-then-else statements, it's a, each one of those logical decisions is a branch. It sends you in different directions. So a computer program is actually an exponentially branching thing, right? Two to the n decisions. It's, it's a two to, the, two to the n tree. Whereas a promise system or a chemistry set is a thing of attraction. It's a thing of aggregation. You give things certain promises and they don't branch out into multiple possibilities. They only have one set of possibilities. So it retains its scale much more, uh, in a much more stable fashion than software, which is based on bifurcation. There's a very interesting report by NASA a few years ago, which I actually referred to in my book. I'll show you that later. Um, which identifies if-then-else statements, basically, conditionals in programming as the main source of uh, aviation errors, uh, flight errors, in, or errors in uh, NASA's flight software. Because each one of those things is an instability that takes all of this environmental complexity and sort of cuts it across a knife, true or false. And if you make the smallest error, you've gone from true to false, you know, best to worst, Yes, or yes to no, and you've made the, the maximum error from that choice. So the notion of if then else seems to us as part of our storytelling extremely natural, but in terms of a process, a natural process, it's extremely fragile. Um, I'll come back to that. Look at this, uh, this next slide. So on the left-hand side, what you have is pillars, independent, parallel, things making promises. On the right hand side you have a house of cards. This is your tower of if then else things. So if I've got two things I can put something else on top and if that then I can put the next thing. This is very very fragile. This thing, each thing is independent. It's an autonomous guy on a motorcycle in Rome. And each one of these things independently keeps its promises and it's much more robust because none of them are dependent upon one another and there's no history to get you into a bad state um, through sort of successive uh, promises which weren't kept, if you like. And yet they're dependent on the floor, right? They're dependent on the floor, of course. Everything is dependent on, on something. Would, would you say that, a paraphrase, would you say that the relationship is that if-then statements are almost like contingencies usually to get to the same goal? And it's better to express the goal rather than the contingency yes. to get to it? Yes. Thank you. It's better to express the goal rather than the contingency. Because the goal brings you together. The goal focuses you on the outcome. Whereas the, whereas the if then else potentially branches you out in directions you may not be prepared for. You're right. If you can cover every single case that comes at you. Well, I, I explicitly use the phrase crap as opposed to Yes, you're right, it's a graph. It is. Uh, we can come back to that maybe afterwards, but there are a lot of things about graphs which allow you to define stability uh, in spite of those, uh, those branching points. Yeah. Are you trying to, to describe the benefits of declarative versus imperative type of this uh, or what, what is that able to So that's a great point. Declarative versus imperative is one of those arguments that goes on in computer science. It's sort of a parallel thing, which is related, you're right. So imperative languages definitely have this linear storytelling uh, approach, and that they have, well, assuming that they're um, smart enough, they have branching. Uh, declarative languages are descriptions of the end state to which you're working towards. Uh, and so they are, in a sense, more like the promises that you're trying to keep than the imperative thing, is, which is the way that you implement it. But 
I think it's rather than thinking declarative imperative, which makes us think, you know, if we choose the right language, we'll be fine. We should rather be thinking that it's that focus on the goals, the, the desired end state, which is the important thing, rather than the particular choice of language. But you're right. But isn't the declarative the whole point? Like if you take a functional language, for example, you define the, the function, and then you know that that's cause the right? So I'm not sure I understand what's the difference. I think if, if you just choose any old functional language, you may get into a mess still. So I, I, I do believe that you need some, some additional notion of simplicity to, to, stay, to keep things clear. So, you know, I've, I've seen all kinds of conflict systems based on XML. Anybody like XML? Any fans of XML? Okay, then I'm only going to offend you. <laughs> so, um, well, if you look a lot of a lot of infrastructure runs on XML. So. A lot of infrastructure runs on XML. I think a lot of in infrastructure is sort of choked up with XML, but we look at it differently. But okay. Uh, so I think of XML. You think of XML as this sort of beautiful crystalline hierarchical description of all of the details. I see it as this gigantic hairball coughed up by a um, you know a diseased cat. Uh, <laughs> Did I just say that? It is a declarative language. <laughs> it is a declarative language, yeah. And it's, you know, it's fine. It's just a big help. <laughs> um, so this is uh, an example, just for just me to throw in a CF Engine slide so that you know we're talking about config management. This is what CF Engine looks like and how it describes its promises. There is a type of promise. Yeah. This is going to be about files. This is the context in which we're going to do this, which is like our inside of our glass. Um, we're in the Linux or Solaris glass. And we're going to configure a file here, which I didn't define, but this is a, the name, say it's etc password. And then I'm going to describe the permissions on this thing as a promise. So I'm going to promise that this file will have these permissions. And because this is declarative, of course, it can have nice comments and so on. And I can even promise to detect all changes on this file over time so that you know, I can do my security tripwires and so on and so on. But uh, the nice thing about this is it's actually documentation. So you can't see that very well. I'm sorry. It says uh, what type? What type? What type? I, even I can't see it very well. <laughs> and this next thing says when and where does it apply? And then it says, what is the affected object? So which thing is going to be affected? What is making this promise? And then it says, why? Why am I doing this? And finally, how? What are the details of this promise? This is kind of cool, because this is the full documentation of the system. What are we trying to do? When and where are we trying to do it? On which objects? Why are we trying to do it and how are we trying to do it? The why is super important. We always forget the why. I always laugh at people, fans of Git, subversion. Only one fan of Git, I'm encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, like, if XML is a giant hairball <laughs> coughed up by it, <laughs> the word Godzilla comes to mind. <clears throat> All right, so the why is super important. And when we commit code changes to, to Git or uh, version control, people write, you know, they, they add their little diff, and they write changed line two of the code to add X. It's like we see that from the diff. Why did you add line two to the code? You know, tell me why. What, what was the reason for it? But we don't do that, right? We always forget the why. But that's really important in a promise-based design. If you're, trying to, if you're trying to end up with some business purpose, if you're trying to implement some intent, you want to know why you're doing it. This is the key part. So the nice thing about promises is you can compose them. And they compose pretty much like bundles of wire. So a promise is almost like short-circuiting your intent to the thing that you're trying to fix. Right? It's like a wire directly from your brain to the thing that you're trying to make. And these bundles of wires allow us to promise multiple pillars over time you know, in, in nice identifiable groups. And just like in the data center, we can cluster these things into related issues and so on and so on. 
So bundles of promises allow us to create structures which belong together, group things into nice ways. They're not hierarchical. So we don't get into dependency hell. All we do is we group things together. It doesn't matter if one of these promises belongs to multiple bundles. Who cares? It's fine. Um, simplicity is a very seductive thing, and we try to uh, achieve it in multiple ways. One of the ideas we've had is to try to make promises in the form of packages. So if only we could put things into containers which are relatively simple, wouldn't that simplify the way that we handle um, uh, deployments and configurations? So if we can get, you know, like the IKEA prefabricated tables and just make our kitchen out of these boxes, it's easy, right? <clears throat> the trouble comes if some of these things, in fact, conflict with one another. Because if you don't have a complete view of your desired end state, you may deploy a bunch of packages and they may start interfering with each other. Um, somebody asked, <laughs> as we were coming in, somebody said, <coughs> You're a physicist, right? So I studied physics at university. My PhD is in physics. He says, why didn't you go into bombs? <laughs> a package manager is very much like a bomb. You explode this thing onto your system, and it just wipes out part of the disk and, and replaces it. It just flattens this thing, and sort of, you know, this is, you're now going to have this infrastructure straight out of this box, and like it or not, this is what you're going to get. Whatever you did before, forget it, it's gone. It's kind of dangerous. If you could break this thing down into atoms with, with finer grain, like these promised, you know, and think of it as a chemistry building up, then you could arrange for a model in which it wouldn't matter if things overlapped. You wouldn't be carpet bombing your systems with packages. You would be building from the, the base up and growing it with a chemistry so that you achieve the purpose that you're trying to get. It's a little bit harder to do it like that because we like to think, okay, now I've bundled, I've bundled all my stuff in this box, I just chuck it out the plane, we're done. What are you saying though about object-oriented abstraction because I could take complex things and if I don't have a leaky abstraction, my interface describes all I need to know and if I just know the interaction between the interfaces, then, you know, there's a few different ways of composing it. That's, I could hide complexity or that. Are you saying something consistent with that or? <clears throat> You're absolutely right. So the problem of how to compose these things is where all of the magic happens. But what I'm going to argue in the, the coming slides is that that is exactly the problem that we have to solve. All of this distraction about how we build the components is completely irrelevant because ultimately, that will matter not one iota. Okay. It's only when we start seeing how these things that we've built, these monsters we've created, actually fight one another, mm -hmm. uh, then that we will see exactly what it is we've designed and what we've built. And, and that is the thing that a promise-oriented view of a system can allow you to think about in the same way that you think <coughs> about all the different levels, you know, from the smallest to the largest. Whereas if we try to think in terms of these stories about how we build things, we never really reach the point at which there is a story about how all of these interactions don't work together. Yeah? Well, I miss the connection between bundles and packages. And are you talking about something different than what is conventionally called containers? Next slide. May I? Well, can I come back to that? So. Maybe we've tried to oversimplify the problem using package managers. I mean, it was a good idea. Fair enough. Uh, it's better than golden images. It's uh, maybe better than doing everything, you know, every single bit by hand. It was a kind of halfway house between the total image and manual configuration of everything. But it hasn't been terribly successful. And you only have to look at the wide range of different solutions to package management to see that we haven't quite figured it out yet. It doesn't mean to say we won't figure it out. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with the idea of a package-based system or a container-based system. 
But so far, I don't believe any of the existing implementations do it right because they base themselves on hierarchies of dependency, which have strong coupling. Uh, what we need is a system with weak coupling, like the parallel pillars of my earlier slide. And, and are you going to talk who decides uh, the, the dependencies, mm -hmm. in what order things are happening? Who decides? Yeah, if you have the weak coupling and you don't describe, you should don't describe in what order things are going to happen and so they're related, like how, who decides how they happen? So in a weak coupling system, there wouldn't be many layers of dependency it would just be um, if a if a thing wasn't there it wouldn't matter it wouldn't it wouldn't be the the death of, of a thing if it would you know if you if, there are no hard dependencies well, in let me give you an example let's say you have a, a config configuration for a, for a computer and then configure the, configure the database and then the web server and then the web application right this need to happen in exactly that order, right? Like, uh, if no, if they the don't. machine is not there and you try to configure the database without no. an IP, how is that going to work? Sorry, you can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you're describing. They have to happen in a certain order and they have to be connected in a particular way mm -hmm. and only then will you reach the top of your mountain. Not, not all of them, but in some cases you have to have some structure, right? This is what we mean by strong coupling and, and, and hard dependency. This is bad, okay? This is not the way to build systems that will survive. This is the way to build systems that survive. You may not succeed in always doing this, right? You may get a couple of flaws in your building, but you want to aim for this if you want resilience, um, scalability, because this doesn't scale, this does. Got it, so for that example, with the, with the, with the host database, uh, app server and application, how would you do that? Um, <laughs> can I give you a simpler example? Okay. I need LDSO so I can run cat. Yeah. So that's a design. So actually, some people compile static binaries. True. And then there are no dependencies. That's and a way to make the a system very weak coupling. I'm talking about the operating system. Like you need to have a host. Well, an operating system doesn't have any um, strong dependencies built in, necessarily. Can I give you an example of the database? Okay, go ahead. So you have a web application that is heavily dependent on the database. If the database isn't there, you have your web application behave differently, and it tells the user that we're in under maintenance. That's a very simple approach to this thing. So. You can't guarantee the database will be 100% the host, what is the application you have, on top of? You have, <coughs> you have multiple hosts. I, I think we've solved this problem a different way, right? I mean, we take care of monitoring degraded uh, operational mode and retry logic. I mean, together with these three things, we, we solve the problem today, right? I mean, as long as your application has a degraded mode and you have a retry logic and you have monitoring built in, do. Right, so I mean, <clears throat> maybe we come back to this discussion at the end because there are different ways to have different levels of strengths of dependency. One, one way to minimize the uh, fragility of a strongly coupled model is to have redundant pieces that you can retry and fail over. That doesn't necessarily make it weakly coupled, but it makes it uh, f um, plastic in the sense that it can deform and survive. But even the failing over has a certain strategy, right? You don't just fail over randomly, right? So you have to fail over in a certain order, right? First the <coughs> master, then the slave, and stuff like that, right? I think that if you've built a certain order into your system, you, you've already made it fragile. And that's the lesson. That's what, then these things are not autonomous anymore. They're actually dependent on one another. And that is what we're trying to avoid. Yeah? Well, but we're getting, we're getting towards the border, you know, application stack and, and, and that takes you into the realm of service discovery and self-organizing systems. And things like that. And I don't know where the border is. I haven't looked at CFM in 10 years. I don't know where the border is in your thinking or the, or the tools between uh, that single box, a cluster, uh, an application stack, orchestration and stuff like that. So that's, uh, I think the, the questions there are valid.
you can do that. Um, but what people mean by service orchestration today is again, I think what people call orchestration today is not orchestration in my mind. It's sequential storytelling. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. For me, orchestration is what an orchestra does. You write a, a sheet of music where everybody's part is written in parallel. Everyone looks at this music and they see that part and they play it. But not randomly. Not randomly, there's coordination, but it's not ordered. It's not, um, the agents, the parts are not one after the other. And what, does the, what does the director do? The, the so exactly that, right? No, so he's not doing exactly uh, that. What you can have is <laughs> promise depending on another promise. So the, let's come back to that at the end. I mean, no, I disagree with the, your interpretation of the orchestra thing. But anyway. Um, one, one thing I think you're assuming, though, with existing pieces, this will be hard to do. But I think that's a really good example of that retry. In a way, if each piece had basically their preconditions and effects, <coughs> and then they could retry to see if the preconditions hold, it could run independently and it could be much more robust and you, then they can almost like order, they could almost order automatically so you don't have to have somebody on top, a conductor who's ordering them, you could build these pieces so they achieve the overall goal. So I mean this is a great point, so why don't we run with this a little bit because if you look at how nature solves the resilience <coughs> problem even in the face of um, dependencies. <coughs> Excuse me. What we're looking at is materials. Take a metal. It's a bunch of atoms that are strongly coupled to one another. It's a material. Uh, and then take something like glass, which is also a bunch of atoms strongly coupled to one another. The difference between metal and a glass is that when you pull a metal, or you hit a metal, or you, know, you smash it with a hammer by the power of Odin, or whatever, then the atoms can move around and fail over. They have a coupling which breaks, but it hits the next one and it attaches to that. So something, there's a safety net which catches the breakage and repairs it. It's sort of self-healing. It's not exactly what it was. It does deform, but it adapts to the pressures that it's under. Glass, on the other hand, is not able to do that because it's too rigid, and so it uh, tends to shatter because it has little cracks in it, actually. But if we can build systems that are resilient because they're plastic enough to be able to flow and fail over to, the, to an equivalent thing, then we will make things that, in spite of the limitations of strong coupling, can still be resilient and scalable, like a piece, like a sheet of metal. Uh, and we start, but but we can only get that by thinking at the level of, like sheets of atoms, not that singular molecule that I had. That thing didn't scale. That couldn't fail over to anything. But if you make a whole sheet of those things that can can sort of flow and attach to one another and 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 cover each other's asses, if you like, want to put it like that. Then we can make something resilient by collective behavior. And so it's a transition from individual things to collective behavior, which is going to take us to scalability and resilience. Well, I think we're actually seeing that in a sec. May I? OK, yes, go ahead. Go, go. go on. So, uh, at this point, let, let's assume that you are developing a web application and deploying a particular code, which requires a particular database change uh, to be done. So in other words, the dependency is the database change has to be deployed first and followed by the uh, code. If you release the code first, the application code, what happens is you're going to get errors. So I think that's exactly what you're looking for. But who cares about those errors? If you wait 10 minutes, it'll fix itself. On the time scale of... Um, no, that's not going to be working in a real, real life scenario. Well, uh, let's assume that you are uh, having... Let a, me tell you, I mean, that's fine. I understand what you're saying. But you are thinking of this one molecule which is going to be perfect and fo fully formed from the beginning and it's not, there's not going to be anything wrong with this thing. I'm thinking, you know, if you manage to get that exactly right, more power to you. But I bet 90%, well, I bet... 5% of the time you don't get that right, and it breaks anyway. So your nice story about, we must do this, we must do this, we must do this, it's useless if you can't do it. 
what you should be saying, this is what Adrian Cockroft at Netflix has been talking about for a long time, is you should build the system expecting every one of those things to fail at all times. It's going to fail, you're going to get it in the wrong order, and you've got to end up with the right thing anyway. So it doesn't really help us to say, we must get it right by the power of Odin, because that's not going to help you. Mark, uh, <laughs> add to it, everybody is not Netflix, yeah, the people and the skill set, no, developers. No, you're right, everybody is not Netflix, but everybody is going to become Netflix. Yeah. Uh, and because if we don't, then we won't have scalable infrastructure, won't have scalable applications. And this is really what I'm trying to say. So my talk is the future of config management, the future of these things. And I'm, what I'm going to try to argue for you for the rest of the, the talk is that this is the way we have to go if we're going to build scalable, resilient systems. Forget the cloud. I don't care if it's in-house, in out, out of house, if it's on the cloud, if it's on a mobile device. It doesn't matter. What's important is you have fabrics rather than, than individual things. We're basing resilience on collective behavior, not individual behavior not on perfect uh, sculptures which we make, these monolithic software systems that we made in the past, but on service-oriented systems that promise each other things and can fail over and lead to resilience through parallelicity, paralliz parallelism. So here's a bunch of, here's a word cloud of, of things that are just going on. There are too many things to talk about in detail. But so containers and virtual machines, these are ways of drawing boundaries around <coughs> agents, things that can make promises. So what's inside is, is what we can do ourselves, and what's outside is what we're going to, who, who we're going to promise to. Uh, this idea of immutable configuration, it's kind of a nonsense, that you can simplify the configuration problem by just making it so, just having like a golden image fine, but it's kind of covering up the details of how you make it. Um, mission criticality. So how do we make true resilience? You know, is it by being absolutely perfect, or is it by allowing failure and, al and building for redundancy in the first place? Caching is a way of scaling up and al enabling redundancy and failover, in a sense. You know, all of the denormalization, which is like caching, Instead of having a single database record, which is supposed to be cons for consistency, you spread them all over the place and you have multiple things. And then you have different issues like eventual consistency or absolute consistency, but these are the things you have to deal with. So as we scale up, we meet all of these different um, issues. And many of them are limited by the two things at the bottom. First of all, economics. How expensive is it to handle the, the system in this way? You know, if it costs me four times as much to make uh, a Netflix-like system, I'm not going to do it. But if it's cheap for me to do that, if we make it easy for people to build systems like that, we're going to do it. If we're, if we're going to, if it's really cheap and easy to manage golden images, we're going to use golden images. If it's cheap and easy to do configuration management like CF Engine, we're going to do that. So economics dictate many of our habits. But the other thing that dictates them is the economics of our brains, which is how easy is it to understand. If something is really hard to understand, we're not going to do that. And if something is easy to understand, we're probably going to do that. And that goes back to these stories, because the stories we tell are so important to us. So, I mean, in, a, in a way, it seems what you're saying is you're sort of moving the if and else from the, from the configuration side into the application side. Now you can argue that that's a better way to build software where your application